invite you to open your Bibles to the third chapter of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. John, the third chapter, follow along in your Bibles as I read the first eight verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can, can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. And so is every one that is born of the spirit. A well-known preacher had this to say about worship a number of years ago. He said, I have come to the conclusion that worship is not just for teaching. Worship is for experiencing. He said, when I preach, for example, on repentance, I don't want the congregation to go away just understanding the concept of repentance better. I feel that the worship service has not really done what it was intended to do unless every worshiper repents before he leaves. This morning, we're going to talk about the new birth. And what we need is not just to learn more about the new birth, but for every single person in this congregation to experience the new birth before we dismiss this meeting. Oh, you say, I already have. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Conversion should be a daily experience, and that's the reason for our title this morning, Ye Must Be Born Again, and Again, and Again. Our emphasis comes from the last part of the seventh verse in our chapter, Ye Must Be Born Again. Some of us, I believe, are attempting to live the Christian life by divine surgery. Lord, please take out my gallbladder so that I won't be so bitter. Please, Lord, operate on this tongue of mine that I will not talk so much negatively about others. Lord, please give me a heart bypass that my heart might more perfectly serve you. We want to serve God through divine surgery, but God wants us to serve him through divine birth. The Christian life is not a renewal of the old. The Christian is a new creation. Jesus said, you must be born again. Who needs it? Jesus said, ye. I believe he was talking to every worshiper in this room this morning. Ye must be born again. Even the best are lost without it. And Nicodemus, in our passage, expressed a fair bit of shock here. And sometimes we thought the shock was in the fact that Jesus said, you must be born again. 
But really the greater shock to Nicodemus was he must be born again. He could understand the business of being born again. It was actually a part of Jewish tradition. When a Gentile wanted to become a Jew, he was baptized and he was circumcised. And this was a process by which he was actually considered to be reborn as a Jew. Nicodemus understood what it meant to be born again, but he didn't understand that it could really mean him. I doubt there is a worshiper here this morning, but that could tell us a great deal about being born again. The question is, do we know all of the theory about the new birth, or have we had the experience of the new birth? Nobody will ever get good enough to be saved. Chapter 3 and verse 1 again, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now Nicodemus, I want to suggest, was a good man. There may not be a single man or woman in this entire congregation that was as good a person as was Nicodemus. First of all, he was a Pharisee, that is, he was a scholar of the law, a stickler for the law, zealous for God's law. Today we would say he was one of the professors over at the seminary. This man knew his business, he knew his theology. Verse 1 also indicates that Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, that is, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. In today's language, we would say he was on the General Conference Committee, a highly respected man. History tells us that he was an extremely wealthy man. He was rich and he was generous. Now, sometimes you find rich Christians. Sometimes you find generous Christians, but when you find a rich and generous Christian, you found yourself quite a man. Desire of Ages, page 169, he was widely esteemed for his benevolence and his liberality in sustaining the temple service, and he felt secure in the favor of God. Nicodemus never got behind in his contribution to the church budget. This man was as highly respected, as moral a man as you could find. And it was to this man that Jesus said, ye must be born again. And if a man as good as that needed a new birth, that deep into his religious experience, is there a person here this morning that is not in need of that same rebirth? Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We need the righteousness of Jesus. Brethren and sisters, the church cannot save us. Verse 1 again, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A ruler of the Jews. You see, Nicodemus equated being a child of Abraham, being a Jew, with his salvation, with being saved. And it might just happen to you and to me. To be a member of a certain church, to be a member of a particular denomination, that is to be saved. You know, one of the frightening things that happens when we get involved in problems involving church discipline where people may receive a reprimand or censure or even disfellowship is that I've noticed over the years that people are so resistant to being disciplined by the church. Some people will go to just about any extremes to stay in the church or to get back in the church as though salvation depended completely and only upon one's church membership. Now the church is a greenhouse where Christ grows Christians. If you want to grow, you ought to be in the church. 
The environment is just a little bit better for growth. Oh, there are problems, there are disease in a greenhouse, for sure. But things do grow better in a greenhouse. It's a controlled environment. If you want to grow as a Christian, you ought to be in the church. But brothers and sisters, putting a dead plant into a greenhouse will not make it grow. The only kind of plant that will grow is one that has life. Ye must be born again. Not one worshiper is excluded this morning in this command of Jesus. He speaks to every member of this church, every member of this congregation. As you come to God's house this morning, ye must be born again. And then Jesus said again in our seventh verse, look at our seventh verse again. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. What is that? What does it mean to be born again? It's an analogy for what we call, usually call conversion. You can't completely explain it because it's not as much a theory as it is an experience. Verses 9 and 10, John 3, verses 9 and 10. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? Nicodemus was theologically learned, but he was spiritually ignorant. The new birth is like falling in love. You can never really fully understand it until you fully experience it. Now, I've heard a lot over the years about new theology. You know, some new idea comes in the church. There runs among some Christians a general philosophy that someday we're going to come up with some grand new idea that's going to finish the work up, a new idea that's going to make us all saved, that's somehow going to get us all across the finish line. And so every new idea that comes along, some people will grab at it instantly. This now is going to solve all my spiritual problems. I need a new idea. I need a new theology. Now, I believe we ought to keep our minds open to new ideas as God te- leads us individually in our Christian walk and as a church as we follow God's leading in our church, and we've seen it through history. But brother, new, church, new truth isn't going to save us if we've been neglecting old truth. I believe we must all of us very carefully be sure we understand the basics of how God saves people. But having understood that, following what we know may be more important and more helpful to us than more mere knowledge. We hear the term new theology, new theology. Brethren and sisters, the greatest need of the church today is not new theology, but new hearts. We must be born again. When John was in secondary school, he spent quite a little time playing the trumpet. And he thought he was pretty good at it. And John went off to college and he was so pleased he was given first chair of some dozen or so trumpets in the college band. And then one day during practice, John goofed. Everybody heard it. The conductor wrapped his baton and he said, why don't you two fellas trade places? Oh, on second thought, why don't you move down one chair further still? And John was now in third chair. He was so humiliated, so embarrassed in front of the entire band. But John knew the reason. He had an old trumpet. What he really needed was a brand new and better trumpet. If he just had a new trumpet, he could get his old chair back. And so he pleaded and he begged until finally his folks helped him buy a beautiful new trumpet, about as fine a trumpet as you could buy. John got his new trumpet, but he never got his old chair back. 
Because the truth of the matter is that what John needed was not a new horn, but more practice on the old one. Brethren and sisters, the greatest need of the church is not new theology, but more practice on the old theology. What we need is that 2,000-year-old theology of Jesus. We need the new birth. What is the new birth? The new birth is an inward experience that leads to outward change. Verse 5. Verse 5 in one tiny three-letter word has the whole basics of righteousness by faith. John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You wouldn't expect an awful lot of theology in the word and, but that's where it is here in this verse. Water, that's the external act, specifically baptism. The spirit, that is the inward presence, God's spirit in your life. Jesus says that unless and until we have both the inward presence and the outward sign, we are not ready for the kingdom. And the devil has tried desperately to separate those two all through the years. Sometimes he says, well, if you just get cleaned up on the outside, if you get baptized, he's okay with that as long as you don't have a new heart. He's just fine with that. Sometimes he says, well, if you have the inward presence, that's good enough. It, it is, after all, what's inside that counts, right? He doesn't care which extreme we go to. If only we could have one without the other. But don't forget Jesus said, and... Salvation comes only when we have both the inward presence and the outward sign. And never accept any theology that does not emphasize both. Verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now I enjoy going out doors on most days when the weather is amenable. One thing that I don't like doing when I go out to work in my garden is if there's a really strong wind. You know, so sometimes, especially in the spring, in the next couple of months, we're going to get those 30, 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Not very pleasant to be out in that. And so when I kind of wonder if what the weather's like, I don't even have to go outside. I usually look out my window and I look at the trees and the bushes, and I can tell right away if it's going to be a windy day or not. Because when there's wind, you see the movement in the branches and in the leaves. When the branches are not moving on the trees, you know the wind is not blowing. Because when the wind blows, the tree moves. And this is the way it is with the coming of the Holy Spirit, says Jesus. For the Holy Spirit comes, although you cannot understand all about how or why. You know that something changes and something moves. The coming of the Holy Spirit into a person's life will move a man's life. The coming of the Holy Spirit moves a woman's life. The coming of the Holy Spirit into the life moves a young person's, a child's life. And I don't care how much we might claim to possess the Spirit, if it has not changed the life, if it has not caused movement in the life, Jesus says it doesn't pass the test as being the genuine thing. You test the presence of the Holy Spirit by the movement in your life. All of a sudden, you want your eyes to see different things. You want your feet to take you different places. And you want your heart to love different things. Why do branches move? Branches move because of two things. The power of the wind and the flexibility of the branch. 
How do people move toward God? No more of their own power than the branch can move of itself. Just as a branch is dependent upon the wind to move, we are dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit or there can be no movement in our lives. But the branch does have its part to play. It stays flexible. It is willing to be moved. Its part is willingness and cooperation. And then Jesus said, not only ye must be born again, not only ye must be born again, he said ye must be born again. There's just no way to heaven without it. Verse 3 again, John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Folks, we're talking about something that means our soul's salvation. Without whatever we're talking about here, we cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus made it very clear. Ye must. Now, Christ never demands from us what he does not supply to us. How do you receive the new birth? May I make two suggestions? First of all, we stop resisting. John 3 and verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Some people simply cannot wait to get rid of God because their God makes them feel condemned all the time. If you're serving a God who makes you feel condemned all the time, by all means, get rid of him. Because it's the devil, it's not God. Because Christ does not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So many people have a confusing picture of God that they grow up with or that they've learned over the years. And they think God's doing everything he can to try to find fault with somebody to keep them out of heaven. When exactly the opposite is true. God is doing everything in his power to make sure every one of his children is there. That's the kind of a God we serve. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. It's not hard to fall in love, young people, with some people. And you young fellows are very much aware it's not too difficult to be attracted to some girls. Some it might take a little work. But some you just can hardly keep from it because they're so lovely. Now, I met my future wife when I went off to college, and I was only there a couple of weeks, and I met Sandy. And if, yeah, there was physical attraction there at first. I'm sure not on her part, but certainly on my part there was. But you know, I recognized right away when I started talking with her and spending time with her, there was a sweetness, there was a kindness, there was a beauty of character that I found so attractive. And it made me want to spend more and more time with her, to get to know her better. I wanted to do that because I was attracted to her. I was in love with her. Folks, if we just understood the loveliness of God, we would find it so easy to be attracted when we see especially God's love for those who even hated him. It's hard to hate God. It's so easy to love him. The strong pull of God's love will just draw you if you stop resisting. It was John who later said, or quoted Jesus, John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. If we draw people by showing them the true character of God. They will be drawn to him. They will want to fall in love with him. 
to spend time with him, to draw closer and closer to him. And then secondly, we should stop, to not only stop resisting, we must start trusting. And now we come to John 3, verse 16. And I'd like us all just to repeat that together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Whosoever believeth, that means to trust Christ. How do you have the new birth? You stop resisting the love of Christ and you start trusting Christ. You stop trusting yourself. You stop trusting your church to save you. You start trusting Christ to save you. You trust Christ to change you. How to be born again? To be born again takes a divine miracle, the same kind of divine miracle as when Jesus was born of Mary. And how did that happen? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit simply reached down and planted Jesus within Mary. And you need this morning for the Holy Spirit to simply reach down and plant Jesus within you. Why Mary? Because Mary was willing to trust God no matter the consequences. And when we trust God the way that Mary trusted God, the Holy Spirit waits this morning to come and by divine miracle, as great a miracle as the conception of Jesus, plant him within you this morning. Ye must be born again. Ye. No matter your church membership, Nicodemus was a chosen Jew. No matter how many good deeds you may have performed through the years, Nicodemus was a good, a generous man. Even if you have done it a thousand times before, this morning ye must be born again. Ye must. Remember that Christ never demands from us what he does not supply to us. Let's reach up and stop resisting and let's trust Christ this morning to implant himself within our lives. There was a little wolf that was born in sheep country on a high point of land just above the valley where the sheep were always grazing. And as he sat there looking at the sheep, this little wolf sometimes envied them deeply. Because you see, when mother and dad made a fresh kill, they ate wonderfully. But sometimes in between, they were often quite hungry. And he noticed that the sheep always had plenty to eat. And he wanted to be a sheep. Besides, mother and dad were off and off hunting, and he found himself alone after hour after hour after hour. But he noticed that the sheep always had the shepherd with them. He never went off and left them, and they always had each other, and they enjoyed playing king of the mountain together. And oh, how he wanted to be a sheep. And one very hungry day, his dream got to be just too much. And he slipped down and he came up behind the shepherd. And softly he spoke, please, sir. Hearing a strange voice, the old shepherd turned around. And when he saw this little young wolf, he lifted up his club to kill him. Oh, please, sir, please. I just want to be a lamb. Would you just let me be one of your lambs? What kind of fool do you think I am? You'd come into the flock and you would eat up all my sheep. No, no, please, honest. I won't eat anything but grass. I will be a vegetarian. I will even be a vegan. I promise. Well, the kind shepherd felt sorry for that lonesome little wolf. But he said, listen, it would never work. If you trot out there among the sheep, they'd all scatter and run. They'd be afraid of you. Okay, tell you what I'll do. 
I'll skin that dead lamb and I'll make you a coat. And sure enough, you know that little wolf could walk right in among the sheep and he just seemed right at home and he excelled at king of the mountain when he played with the sheep and he started to eat grass. And at first he seemed to be quite happy, but you know, grass really never did taste quite good to him. It never left him satisfied. And one day he put his muzzle up high into the air and he smelled the odor of dead cow. His father and his mother had made a fresh kill. And he slipped around quickly to the shepherd and he said, please, sir, would it be all right if I slipped away tonight and just had a little dead cow? I've tried eating grass. It doesn't really taste that good. Would it be all right just this once? Kind of a sad smile, the old shepherd lifted him up and he patted him gently on the head. He said, poor little fellow, I've noticed that you don't really enjoy eating grass. And as a matter of fact, lately I've seen you nipping at the lamb's heels every now and then. I know you've tried. We have both tried. The final truth of the matter is the only way to enjoy being a lamb is to be born a lamb. Brother, sister, we might have tried just about everything. We might have tried divine surgery. We might have tried acting like Christians, pretending to be Christians, doing the things that we know Christians are supposed to do. We might have been extremely faithful in supporting the church. We might have tried working for the church, accepting a church office, maybe serving on the board. We've tried everything except to be born again. The only way to enjoy being a lamb is to be born a lamb. And the only way to enjoy being a Christian is to be a born again Christian. And that's why Jesus whispers quietly to your heart this morning. This morning, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again and again and again. I challenge you today, every day, give your life anew to Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we serve such a loving God, such a forgiving God, such a generous God. And we celebrate you today as we worship you. Lord, my prayer today is that no one will leave this place of worship without giving their lives completely over to you to be born again. That we'll stop trying to just do the things that we know a Christian ought to do. But that we will have a change of heart that will be born of water and of the Spirit. And Lord, if there's anyone in this congregation today who hasn't yet given their life to you and made that public confession by baptism to completely turn their life around, to let you into their lives and make that public declaration, we know that Jesus said you must be born of water and of the Spirit. So if anyone has resisted turning their lives completely over to you and not been baptized, I pray that they will make that decision. And then, Lord, those who have been baptized, sometimes we are content with that because after that, no one can see our hearts. And we fake it and we hide it. But we know that when the Spirit comes into our hearts, when we're born of water and of the Spirit, that we are moved and we are changed. And our feet will want to go different places and our eyes will want to look at different things. 
and we love different things in our lives than what we used to. So Lord, we want you to change our lives every single day. We want to die daily, as Paul said, and every day be born again as your children. Help us each one to have that experience today and every day that we can be your lambs born, reborn as your children every day. Lord, we so so thankful for your love and forgiveness and we just pray that as we leave this place of worship today that everybody here will have a clean heart and a determination to follow Jesus every day and all the way. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.